Well, I just want to say welcome to everyone for being here today. Um, we, uh, again, are really pleased to see you. Very, very happy. And I see, again, so many familiar faces. Um, before we get started, please put your name and institution in the chat. This gives us an idea of um, who is here. And then also, it just helps us as we uh, continue with the rest of the dialogues throughout the semester. Um, this is our spring series for our civic dialogues, and we are happy to welcome uh, new and returning uh, attendees. And so again, thank you again for being here. Uh, as many of you know, I'm Patty Robinson. I'm the Faculty Director of Civic uh, Engagement at College of the Canyons, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Kimberly Rosenfeld, who is Chair of the Education Department and Chair of Women and Gender Studies at Cerritos, and also Jan Connell, who is Emeritus and uh, an Adjunct uh, Professor at Cerritos College and a 3CSN facilitator. Um, so again, Jan and Kimberly, if you guys can just kind of raise your hands there to just say hi. And then also I wanna give a huge shout out to our 3CSN folks who are helping us, uh, Keelan uh, Koenig and also Rebecca Moonstone. And we couldn't be doing this without their help. So again, thank you. Um, for many of you who know about the series and for those of you who are joining for the first time, our Civic Dialogue series began in fall 2020 as part of an intergener uh, excuse me, intersegmental partnership addressing how to create a civic engagement pathway between um, the community colleges and the CSU systems. And then it morphed in something, into something a little bit bigger and based on uh, a previous and also a current Bringing Theory to Practice grant. Um, we are now joined together with COC, Cerritos, LA City College, CSU uh, LA, CSUN, and Cal State Dominguez Hills in presenting this series. Um, and it really started out of COVID. Um, we were hoping to do something in person, and then when COVID started, um, we had to shift gears very, very quickly. And so we created this series, and it's turned out to be a great way to bring people from around the country um, to this event. Also, our main reason for starting this was to foster greater understanding of civic learning and democratic engagement, and as a way of bringing the nation's leading scholars, researchers, and practitioners from a variety of different disciplines, all working to advance democracy throughout our country and in higher education um, to this platform. Um, these presentations are recorded and available through uh, 3CSN, so we are also collecting and creating a great repository and archive. Um, our presentation is set up in two parts. The guest speaker today will talk, and then you will have an opportunity to also engage with our speaker. And then the second hour, which starts at 12, will be our deep dive. And at that point, those of you who would like to stay on, you will move into our stay on the, the, the Zoom. We will move into the second hour where Kimberly, Jan, and I will do a deep dive into the presentation. And lastly, the three guiding frameworks for advancing and understanding of the intersection between equity, agency, and civic engagement. We're recognizing civic community and democratic engagement as a high impact practice uh, that is attached or aligned with guided pathways. And we're also leveraging participants' current knowledge to build capacity to innovate for local and global change. And with that, it is my great honor to introduce today's speaker, um, Los Angeles public artist, Deborah Ashheim. And I'm gonna read just a short bio uh, about Deborah, and then also um, mention that she has been working specifically with College of the Canyons. Um, and I know she's gonna talk a little bit about her artwork that she's been doing for our place project. Um, but again, welcome Deborah. Deborah makes installations, sculptures, drawings, digital and social media projects and temporary um, interventions into public spaces. Her projects, often exploring memory and place, are based on historical research and community engagement. She has been artist in residence at the Los Angeles County Registrar Recorder County Clerk's Office, Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Center, UC San Francisco's Memory and Aging Center, and the Santa Monica Fire Department. Deborah has exhibited across the US and has created uh, public artworks uh, for the Santa Monica Fire Department, Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Center in Downey, uh, Amazon.com in Seattle, and the city of Sacramento. She has received numerous grants from, this, uh, from the California Community Foundation, the cities of Los Angeles, Pasadena, and Glendale, and she's been artist in residence in a variety of different locations um, in California and in the country. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Deborah. And Deborah, thank you so much for being here today. 
Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. And uh, I guess I'm going to jump right into screen sharing. So let's see if we can do this easily. Um, so I'm so I kind of make my living doing um, big permanent things for buildings, but my favorite projects a lot of the time are temporary things for like um, public transit and um, you know things that go up for like up to a year um, where I can really turn ideas around really quickly and in um, 2017, uh, I had the uh, good luck to be selected um, as one of the artists for San Francisco Arts Commission's Art on Market Street. So San Francisco Arts Commission has this great program. They take um, 36 of the city bus um, uh, kiosks, you know, the, like the place where they usually have movie posters and stuff, and they always reserve them for artists. So it's kind of like a string of them. If you walk down Market Street, you see them all, and they have a different theme every year, and they, they select three artists, and they each um, get to have their posters up for four months each. And so in 2017, the theme was... Um, was the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love. And they wanted to ask some artists that were not old enough to have been around or even born during the Summer of Love to, for their take on it. And, um, and I had been doing a lot of work about excavating the 1960s. My work is about memory. It's been about memory for a really long time, like since maybe 2000 and five. Um, and in the most recent phase, it's about collective memory, which is something I've been looking for in the public spaces of history and architecture. So I went up to San Francisco and I spent a lot of time in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley in the art special collections at UC Santa Cruz at the um, GLBTQ Museum, which they started with G instead of L, I don't know why, um, in San Francisco, all these archives looking for images that were sort of like orphaned, maybe forgotten negatives that had never been printed, um, that I wanted to resurrect to tell stories about the radical ideas that had informed the Summer of Love. Why was this such a magnet for creative and alternative people? What was the literary, political, social um, context um, for the Summer of Love. So my project was called The Zeitgeist, and it was six posters. They each repeated six times. And um, I used these images with permission. So this is uh, Mother and Child from a free, free Huey rally from a photo by um, Ruth Marion Baruch, who was an organizer with her husband, Perkle Jones, um, that worked a lot with the Black Panther Party when they first formed in Oakland in 1966. And the quote is from Kathleen, Kathleen Cleaver, um, who had been the um, Minister of Education, I think, for the Black Panther Party. Um, but the thing I wanted to show was that the Black Panther Party was also like was, you know, I think it's very well known for the kind of um, confrontational images of the men in black coats holding guns, but it was really also a movement of mothers and families and that the, they pioneered the free kindergarten program for um, low income children and they um, and they had a free healthcare clinic and they were trying to bring down capitalism by having everything for free to support their community. Um, and I also researched the um, the uh, beginnings of the uh, movement against the Vietnam War. This was a really important protest called the um, Spring Moratorium to End the War that was right on Market Street. So it was like April 15th, 1967. And if you were standing there, you would have kind of time traveled, you know, if you, um, and, had the, and had this march, march by you. Um, and there was a, a, a sort of a very early gay rights group called the Vanguard, which we only know about because they made a, a photocopied zine um, and they were part of like Lyndon Johnson's great society programs. But anyways, they organized a protest. They were kids that had, they were, a lot of people came to San Francisco in 1967 and, and lived in the park and, you know, like ran away from home. But these kids ran away from home because they were kicked out by their parents for being gay, which was still like somewhat illegal in 1966. And they did a um, tongue in cheek protest. They borrowed 30 brooms from the city and they used them to sweep Market Street to show, partly to show that they make a contribution and that they weren't the way that they were stereotyped, but also as a tongue in cheek protest to the um, to the police sweeping them up. They had these raids where they would sweep them up for, for vagrancy. Um, so um, th this is from a, uh, we wound up making a publication and having a talk at California Humanities, um, me and the other artists. Um, and this is from the little zine that we made, a, little, a small publication where I talked about how I, exciting I find it is to work in archives. And the reason I'm including this is because I know that this is sort of a humanities-based group and all of these things are related to me, like working in archives, excavating history, trying to think about what it means to us now, making artwork and, um, and engaging the public. 
So um, I came back to Pasadena, which is where I live. And I loved this project so much, but I don't live in San Francisco. I only got to see it once. So I proposed to the um, city of Pasadena that I wanted to do a, a similar project in our city. So I got an individual artist grant to fund it. And then I went to Pasadena Transit, the bus company, and, I, and it turned out they had some um, uh, bus stops, poster um, opportunities that were reserved for public service. And so they often say things about voting or um, shop downtown or you know don't trust the internet. And so they let me have 18 of those. And I, um, and I researched the archives um, of La Raza, which was an ex a very influential um, uh, bilingual publication, grassroots community journal of the Chicano civil rights movement. And the subject that I wanted to celebrate in these posters was more or less 50 year history. It was the 50 year history, but there was context on either end of the high school student walkouts in 1968. So the East LA high school student walkouts are pretty well known. Students from around 13 schools, I think it was in East LA, um, it wound up being about 15,000 students uh, coordinated to walk out of school to protest discrimination against mostly uh, Mexican American schools in the in um, East Los Angeles, but there were also walkouts in Pasadena to protest discrimination against African American students. And it included um, uh, teachers saying racist things to them, but also really importantly, not being allowed to take college, you know, college prep classes, not being mentored to go to college. So I put these posters up all around Pasadena, and uh, these are some of them. You can see these if you go to Pasadena Time Travel. And then they were also the stories that people told me. Oh, so I interviewed 30 participants who are now in their 60s and 70s in the, but had been like 16 year olds or had been um, in the Brown Berets and had been college students at ELAC, you know, East LA Community College um, that provided support to the kids and, um, and then told their stories in English and Spanish on all uh, 29 Pasadena city buses. And um, so this is one of the posters on the bus. And, um, and then we also, I also got a grant from California Humanities to put on a panel discussion. And I had tried to do a, a zine workshop with teens, but it had to be outside of schools and it turned out to be, you guys might know this, but teens are very, very, very busy, but this is the panel discussion. So, um, so with this background, um, I came into a job that was probably my favorite job I've ever had. Um, so these are, this is like Carlos Montes from the Brown Berets, Starla Lewis, who was one of the students from Muir High School. Anyways, um, you can find this all online. But um, in 2019, 2021, I had the great good fortune to be um, selected to be the creative strategist, artist in residence for LA County Registrar Recorder, County Clerk. And this was a pilot program that's now an official program that was um, started under LA County Board of Supervisors Equity and Inclusion Initiative. And it has kind of two goals. One, it embeds artists in county departments, you know, non-art departments, such as like in, the, in our cohort, there was an artist in residence for um, Parks and Rec, there was an artist in residence for the Department of Mental Health, there was an artist in residence for LA County Libraries, and one, and one goal is to use the county departments, which are countywide, because LA County is huge, to bring art to people that um, might not have access to art, you know, like a lot of the um, the, the um, county art um, institutions are concentrated downtown. They're not easy to get to. They don't always have um, free parking. So to put art, to have artists stand out across LA County, but also to um, to use the artists as um, like change agents or um, transformational thinkers to help um, as a kind of a outsider insider to see things that could be done differently or to include art in the regular everyday function of the departments. And that's really what I'm here to talk to you guys about is how can you include art in your teaching, in your civic engagement, in the work that you do on campuses. So what I found, so this is, um, these are some of the, this is, I was embedded with the outreach team at the Registrar Recorder. So the Registrar Recorder County Clerk, sorry, I keep jumping around, but um, they oversee all of the elections for LA County, which is 88 cities and all the unincorporated districts of LA County. LA County is by far the largest and most um, diverse electoral district in the country. We're larger than I think 40 states, um, you know, and it encompasses the area all the way from the beach, you know, Santa Monica, um, all the way to Pomona, and then north-south up, up in Little Rock and um, 
Lancaster, all the way down to Long Beach. It's a it's an incredibly huge county. So I was embedded with the outreach department. This was before COVID, and we would go to events. There weren't usually naked men like this. This was a RuPaul drag con. We got we could go to anything that was family friendly and nonpartisan. So here we are registering voters. And um, and one of the first things I did was I I put I made buttons for all of the outreach workers that said things like ask me about voting after prison because we found like particularly when we went to um, outreach for people experiencing homelessness that a lot of there was a lot of crossover between people experiencing homelessness and um, and formerly incarcerated but it you know was it was stigmatized people who were just as impacted did not want to tell us that's why they didn't want to register to vote so we made these buttons so that. Um, people could ask in a um, way that didn't have to identify whether they had were formerly incarcerated and find out about particularly changes to voting laws that you know now people who have prior felony convictions can vote when they're on probation or parole that passed in 2020 but it was a little bit overshadowed by all the drama of the 2020 election so if anybody wants a button that says ask me about voting after prison i will happily send you one if you will wear it and let people know that people in jail awaiting trial can vote and people who um, are on probation or parole can also vote so anyways i did these sort of small projects as outreach and um and so when i okay back to the thing i was saying so the reason I, that i'm kind of here to recruit you guys or as an ad for having artists in your program is you know if i go to a group of people if i was looking at you right now and could see you all and ask you to raise your hands and said how many of you guys want an artist to come work with your group maybe 10 percent of the people would you know sort of feel com confident and comfortable in their relationship with art that they would want an artist to come but if i said how many of you guys want a creative engage, a, a community engagement specialist to come and work with your group? I think every hand would go up. And I think of artists now, uh, one of their roles can be community engagement specialists. So for example, I was hired sort of to solve problems. One of the problems that the outreach team had often was people would just go by their booth. It would be a family friendly event. Like this was actually a pride event in Compton, but a classic example that I don't have a picture of was we did outreach at the LA Zoo. And, um, and our booth was really boring. It was registered to vote and some information about voting. And then other, other booths had fun things and toys and games and things to engage the kids. So I made a bunch of stickers that were for future voters. And you would figure out what year you were eligible to vote and you would color the stickers. And, and suddenly all these families came over and while the kids were coloring, the people from the outreach team could talk to the parents about um, changes coming to voting, they could register them. And you know the kids didn't wanna leave till their stickers were done. So some things that I did were just really small scale solutions like that. But my bigger project, um, one of the things that in this program, we were all charged to develop a bigger project. And so I thought a lot about groups that, um, that were historically, on, my job was to do outreach to historically underrepresented communities of voters. So that included low income communities, it included communities of color, it included people experiencing homelessness and formerly incarcerated, LGBTQ, people from language communities, um, you know, that, that didn't necessarily get access to information in their language. Um, and uh, people with disabilities. And so I chose um, to work with students at um, 10 Cal States and community colleges because community college, uh, public universities and colleges in um, LA County were intersectional. Students representing all of the groups I just mentioned are part of the student community. Tragically, I learned, you know, tragically might be the wrong word, but it, it really hor unfortunately, I learned that there's a population of students experiencing homelessness at every college, which I'm sure that you guys all know that there's students that live in their cars in order to be able to afford to go to school. I didn't know that before I had that job. And, um, and also students in and of themselves um, are a, uh, are an underrepresented group. They, every election, we always have hand wringing about how they don't vote in as large numbers as we would like. But, um, but, I, but I felt like there had been a lack of resources put to trying to solve this problem. So I reached out to um, faculty and I got, um, I got invited to 10 different schools. This is Cal State Dominguez Hills. And the first thing that I did was I went on kind of a listening tour. I just talked to students about voting, why they vote or don't vote, what's what's intimidating about it, what seems unfair, like the electoral college came up or the fact that every state gets two senators regardless of population and um, and what, what, what might inspire people to vote. And I, one of the things I asked them to do was to think of a friend of theirs that they were pretty sure wasn't gonna vote and think about what might be compelling to them and think about people that inspired them to vote. So these are students at Cal State Dominguez Hills were doing this uh, design thinking brainstorming exercise 
um, where they wrote stuff on post-its and then everybody would get up and, and share their story. And we were just, we did, we did a lot of kind of like wide open collaborative um, dialogue um, exercises in order to develop the projects. And so one of my favorite things about this program, and it, it might make it unsustainable, but I think that people could adapt it for their own small scale use was that every school did an extremely different project because the projects were generated by the students. And uh, essentially I approached them as peer influencers. And, and it was a kind of a peer to peer messaging program. These were art and design students, but they don't have to be. Not everybody has to be from art design or communications. It's just basically they know their audience. They're speaking to a group of their friends. They, they understand what's important to, to their group. And at the Registrar Recorder, we did effective messaging, but it was really one size fits all. And it was top down. And it also, often it was like, you should vote. What's wrong with you if you don't vote? And that was a non-starter with the students. What was really important was listening to them. And actually they had very legitimate and what I thought were valid um, reasons for feeling disenfranchised, discussing them. And then generally once we'd had um, a lot of dialogue, I was amazed at, at how on board people were with, with wanting to be part of Get Out the Vote. They really just wanted to be listened to, be heard. They were grown-ups. They could handle the fact that sometimes you vote for a candidate and they disappoint you. Sometimes you vote for a candidate and they even misled you to get elected. But, but we had to talk about it. So that was great. That was one of my favorite parts of the project. So yeah, so here, this is, um, I've had, I had some slides in here that were for, um, or another project, but I kept them because they remind me of my talking points. So the op so one of the things that was great about the project was opportunity for open dialogue with the students about equity and inclusion and voting, who whose vote matters, you know, and whose vote we want to see. Um, elections and fairness. Yeah, I already covered this. Um, so what we wound up doing was so um, in order to be able for the students who are very 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 busy, like community college students in particular, I have so much respect for them. Often their parents, they work other jobs, and they're full time students, and they're you know trying often trying to go to a transfer to a four year institution. So um, so in order to be able for the um, faculty to have time for the students to work with me because it wasn't going to really work to do extra credit or extra days at school, we had to align my projects with student learning objectives. So in, in almost every school, we adapted an, an, an assignment that was on the syllabus to make it also serve the get out the vote um, agenda. So they were learning about monochromatic color, which is making paintings that were primarily about one color. This is Devin Suno's class at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And then we also had the project be paint a portrait of somebody who inspires you to vote. And so um, the students were um, each telling me and, and Devin about um, the person that inspired them to vote and their stories were so awesome that Devin and I were like, this just can't be an artwork that's gonna be hung up in the vote center. This has to be a bigger project. So, um, so we had them write their stories up and then we made a set of trading cards that was 20 different cards, one of each student's painting. Um, and they um, and they had a, a tagline from their story that about why they, the person inspired them to vote. It could be somebody in their family that was very into voting. Sometimes it was even somebody from their family that wasn't that wasn't that had come here from another country and couldn't vote, but but made sure that their kids voted. One guy said he voted. I can't see it because it's blocked by people, but maybe you can see it over uh, um, on the far right. One guy voted for his son because he wanted to make a better world for his son. Sometimes they talked about a lot of them talked about their families diaspora experiences coming from countries where they where they weren't able to vote. So um, so on the front was the painting and then on the back was um, was the information um, the you know the student story and the university um, really embraced this project and they paid for they split the production cost to double the amount of cards that we made they made posters and they used this as their um, voter education and awareness campaign for the election because they had been I worked with schools that had been selected to be vote centers. So for the first time in 2020, a lot of these um, campuses, you could vote on campus. So it gave you information about where the voting would be. And um, yeah, so that was that was kind of great. And the students had never had their work um, printed before and everybody got a set of 100 cards to share with friends and family. And um, so here's a bunch of the students and their professor and the cards. But at other schools, um, like at Cal State Dominguez Hill, I mean, Cal State LA, I worked with a um, design professor and he just gave it as an optional track. You could either make a speculative poster for imaginary uh, or you know 
client of the um, 2024 Olympics, or you could make posters for me. So if you made a poster for me, it was a little more work. You had to you had to include all this information, you know, the the um, the logos and the and the place and the place to go vote. But your posters got um, got printed, and the and the again the the university took over production and distribution, and they gave the students a big show in the library. So this um, student. He was concerned about the, um, his community, Latinx students that voted in um, smaller, in much smaller numbers than um, than the rest of the population um, when they did the breakdowns. And he wanted to make posters that reference the um, Chicano Civil Rights Movement artwork and self help graphics and the kind of the woodcuts of that movement. And then he made them in Spanish. So you know, so this is like, I put this one in because I just think this is such a great example of the kind of like you could call it like micro targeting that the students could do as messengers. They could just by putting the um, the posters in Spanish and um, and by referencing the the graphic style of these posters from the 60s, he was giving a shout out to a community that he felt was underrepresented in voting and letting them know that their vote matters. But of course, the posters are for everyone, but also um, we know how important it is for people to feel seen and heard in the election. Um, and the other thing that was great, I loved about this project was you didn't have to be eligible to vote to participate in this project. So this student um, invented this mouse character and she did a series of these mice, um, you know, and there's a little mouse on the door that, you know, it says mice can't vote, you know, so it was like a sort of little cute um, poster, but she, then when we were having the conversation about it, she was like, well, you know, the mice stands for people, you know, like, um, one student did posters of um, issues that were nonpartisan, but that she thought would engage students. This was actually, even though it wasn't partisan, um, LA County Registrar Recorder couldn't really have their logo on anything that was even an issue. They really have to stay very, very far from anything that has anything to do with the election. So even though there's nothing, there were no ballot referendums and nobody was exactly running on these, um, we just produced these under the imprimatur of the Department of Arts and Culture. But these are these were you know environmental and public health issues that the student felt would um, engage students engage students and make them know that um, there were things on the ballot that um, that were relevant to them. And then this guy loved his project. He went to uh, um, students with disability, like fifth and sixth grade class, and he had these little kids make drawings of what they um, what they would want to vote for, what kind of changes. He asked them, what changes would you make in the world? And then he made these posters that were based on, on the, their drawings. And so those were, this was a really sweet project. This is a uh, Cal State Northridge. These guys, I went to I, when I first met with them. They were like, "We don't want to do a print project. We're not designers. We're we're like punk rock. We're like really active. We want to do something. Uh, we want to do events." This was again before COVID. So we created this group, which actually they took it over and they became a, a group that I think still exists. Yeah, they, I know they they still exist without me. You can go to their Instagram, CSUN Votes, and um, so they made these stencils. And then every time that the the university had an event like an an exhibition at the gallery or homecoming or you know some other associated students thing we would pop up with these with our airbrush and our stencils and we would stencil um pro voting slogans right onto people's clothes you can see the the student in the middle has um a hand with vote um uh, airbrushed onto her shirt and if you didn't want to wreck your clothes we would make you a tote bag so this is us at um at a, at a gallery opening and um you know we got permission but you know we would we would just sort of pop up and here they are stenciling on my shirt. And then, so, so this is what they did. They cut these out and then they would airbrush it on and then peel it off. And so it was kind of exciting. So this was great. If, I think they would have done this every election if it wasn't for COVID. Um, and then, but some schools could only have me come for one day. They couldn't work on involved projects like that. So like Long Beach City College, I went for one day, but students um, worked with me to develop ideas for posters and then they, and then they made them and the school distributed them. This is a vote in American Sign Language. Um, this is a this is a Kimberly's class at Cerritos. We I couldn't even go. We this was this is a precursor for the pandemic because it was a digital. It was an online class. So we had a contest, and then the the student that won the contest had their um, design made on drink posters that were that um, Kimberly distributed to students at Cerritos. Um, that was great. Um, and then some yeah you know, some some students just made. Um, one of a kind posters and they were, um, this was LA Valley College and they just did it, they gave us all the display cases across the campus. So we exhibited the students work across the campus. Um, but the, the concept was that this deep interactive creative engagement was an effective strategy to generate dialogue with the students. So one thing I really wanna tell you guys about, um, this is a, 
this is at um, Compton College. Compton College, they just, they just, you know, I only could come for one day, but I did have a materials budget. So I bought them all these brushes and sumo paint and we made these giant exuberant posters and put them everywhere. So the way that this, so the primary was in March and I know the community college, a lot of you guys go back in February. Um, and so it was a really tight turnaround for some, there were teachers that wanted to participate and they were like, wow, the only way we can do it would be literally have you come the very first day of school and have that be the first thing we do. And most art classes, and I think that most classes, I'm, I went to liberal arts college, so I'm pretty sure this is how it works. You know, you sort of ease in to the semester, you know, you come back from break, you do some sort of small assignments. Um, that are maybe even more like exercises and then you get into the real content so this totally inverted that it was me coming in all energetic revving them up and they'd had no course content like maybe this was their first art class maybe they hadn't developed any skills in their discipline yet and we were asking them to make something that was going to be shared with the entire campus community and it went it worked amazing and one of the really interesting takeaways was that a lot of the instructors said to me this has revolutionized how i'm going to start my classes because i'm not going to do this incremental slow build model anymore this got the students so excited it was the main thing they were talking about it caused them to to get to meet each other you you know, and to become like socially engaged with each other. And it gave them a big sense of how art could be important to the society, not just a class where they were learning some skills that they might use later if they went on in it. And so, um, so several of the instructors said it was much harder. It was a lot more work. But, um, but I might change how I teach now. I might jump in with this big picture. What can art do? Um, and then they can, you know, and then they'll have the motivation to develop the skills second. That was just so interesting to me because I, I used to teach and I always taught that other way too. I never thought, I never thought of giving them a really big, ambitious, risk-taking assignment before they'd had any course content. So, um, so anyways, all of the students that participated in this project, as much as anything else, I was pleased because they became my get out the vote army. Basically, they all in order to participate, they have to agree that they would become like me and be super annoying and bug at least 10 of their friends by um, you know, pressuring them to get out the vote, talking about the election, talking about what's gonna be on the ballot and they were all pretty game, so that was great. Um, and they, so, and students are the best uh, outreach to other students, like peer-to-peer -peer messaging is by far the best way to get people to vote. Oh, this is at um, East LA College. They just made posters and printed, we printed them and put them everywhere just um because they were a vote center and they and um and and we just it was uh for it was, it was part of the wayfinding to help people find the space so um i'm gonna show you a couple other projects and then we can go to questions this is this was one of my projects that i did for um for starting out for the registrar recorder but the reason i want to show you it is um, because when we transitioned to COVID, this became my main thing that I was doing. So as an icebreaker, when I first got hired, I just started, when I would go out with the outreach team, I wanted a way to talk to them. So I just started asking people, um, hey, do you want to be today's voter? And they would say, what does that mean? And I'd say, can I take your picture? And on the release form where you give me permission to use your photograph, will you put a sentence or two about why you vote? So I started doing this at all, every event and then I was really into it and people liked the drawings, I would email them and let them see them. And the registrar recorder would post them on their Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Um, and so I called it 365 days of voters and I was gonna draw 365 people and then they could post them for however long they lasted. Um, but what happened was, you know, um, we, couldn't do any more outreach, um, in-person outreach after March 12, um, 2020. So I transitioned it to a social media project and then it kind of exploded. So I actually wound up drawing 757 voters and posting them um, on an Instagram that I wound up posting with uh, registrar recorder support, LA County Department of Arts and Culture. And then I also got um, additional funding from the cities of Glendale and Pasadena to continue the project for the fall 2020 election. So if you go to at 365 days of voters on Instagram, or there's also a website, 365 days of voters, 365 days of voters, um, dot com. You can see 757 people who ultimately, you know, because you can't really control the geography of social media, so ultimately represented LA County, but also the rest of California and then the rest of the United States. And so these are all people that mostly sent me selfies. Um, and then along with their reason to vote, and then I drew them. Um, and so that was kind of amazing. Like sometimes I'll meet people, I often meet people that I've never met before, but I drew them because they were in my project. And I'm like, oh, I know you, I drew you. I love the League of Women Voters of Pasadena. Um, and, but I continue to do some outdoor 
in-person outreach, um, even after COVID, even though it wasn't my job anymore, because, oh yeah, so we, so this is my Instagram and the people, here's the drawings of the people. And uh, this is what it looks like in their, in their stories. Um, uh, so these are, these are some of the earlier ones. This was from the RuPaul drag con event that I showed you earlier. Um, this is one of the drag queens. Um, they're so amazing. Um, this is a, a, a disability rights activist in LA County. People just, a lot of them gave a shout out to the group that they represent and why voting was important to the group they're in. Uh, before COVID, every month they would have uh, um, a naturalization ceremony at the convention center where like 5,000 people at once would get their citizenship and, we, and they were all eligible to vote. So we would try to register them all. And so um, I got to meet people from all around the world that had become um, uh, American citizens and, and were eager to exercise their new right. Um, sorry, I put that in twice. So, um, well, so the, so the in-person outreach that I continued to do was to groups that I was never gonna meet on social media. So I would go on Every Wednesday is uh, the fall of 2020. I used to do voter um, registration at Homeboy Industries. So I met a lot of justice impacted people who maybe hadn't valued their right to vote before it was taken away, but were very eager to get it back. Sometimes people um, were even willing to um, reveal their status as um, formerly incarcerated in order to inspire other people. I would always double check with them before I posted and be like, are you really sure you want to tell everyone? But some, some people felt really strongly about it. I went down to Compton to um, to food banks um, because I wanted to make sure that people from low wealth communities were included in my project because um, there were issues that um, they wanted to be a voice for. Um, and we would go to Echo Park because people who are experiencing homelessness can still vote. I love this guy. He said, um, I'm homeless and I still vote. Um, so this was uh, one of the people I met at Echo Park. And um, so in partnership with the city of Pasadena, um, Pasadena Transit again, and um, and the Pasadena Individual Artist Grant funded this. And um, I partnered with the city clerk's office so that we could put the voter stories, particularly Pasadena voters on the tra transit buses again, along with a QR code that, and also information in text about where and how to vote in the upcoming uh, 2020 election. And, uh, oh yeah, and then one more project I'll tell you and then we can go to questions. Um, uh, another community engagement project, um, which actually started when I was um, going doing Get Out the Vote, and I met, I started meeting people at rallies that um, were uh, families that were um, imp impacted by law enforcement violence, and they were particularly um, intersecting with my efforts to get out the vote for 2020 because we had the um, the election to replace um, the um, LA County um, District Attorney. Um, and it had been Jackie Lacey who the families were unhappy that she was unwilling to investigate some of the um, use of force incidents. So I started inviting some of these families to come to my studio to draw them because um, I was just really moved by, you know, they're very reluctant activists. It's a lot, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a movement of moms. Um, but they, um, but because they, because they want justice for their loved ones, they had um, been drawn into this um, social justice movement. And so Originally, I started drawing them because I was thinking, well, maybe they could use these drawings um, as support for their cause. They could use them to raise awareness. Maybe my civic engagement will be just creating visual materials that will help um, make their help their voices be heard and make their stories compelling. But then, what I what I realized when I started meeting these families and getting to know them, they start a lot of them started asking me if I would make a drawing for them of their lost loved one because. Um, well, um, one of the first things that happens is if um, you lose somebody, it's always horrible to lose a child, but if you lose them to violence, particularly state violence in a, you know, in a system where you might feel really powerless, everything becomes about the way they died. And so for the families processing their grief and healing, it was difficult to move on. Um, the, the discourse around the terrible way that the person died was interfering with their, with their remembering them the way they lived. And so, and then the other thing that um, was true just because of how we live now was that, you know, we don't really take pictures and print them out anymore. We don't go to the portrait studio and we don't, you know, we don't process rolls of film. And, and so a lot of times, uh, you know, a young person in the middle of their life, all their family had was, um, was like their Instagram posts or, you know, pictures on their phone. And so I could, I could take some of these, I got better at drawing from even pretty low grade source material to try to create portraits. Um, and they really became, sometimes they use them um, 
for um, raising awareness, but really I think they, they're more um, for healing and just for rem helping remember. And so in that way, it's come full circle to my work being about memory um, uh, because, um, because memory, I, I now see you know, it's an important part of mental health. And, and, and for the families, I think the gesture of an artist making something for them for free and also um, just something that they could hang on their wall and have the person be with them every day. So I interview the people, um, often the moms, sometimes the sisters, for about half an hour, to have them tell me stories about the person. And it, it's funny with, with some of the young men, because I know that young men, you know, there's a lot of pressure on them to seem like masculine and tough. And, and sometimes when I first see the photos, they do, they seem like a somebody that, you know, that might look like kind of like a um, skateboarder or something, you know, and then, um, and then when they tell me their, when the moms tell me their stories, I look at the same photo again, and I see the vulnerability of the person, I see their humor, I see how they were a protector to their little younger siblings, and, you know, and, and all their aspirations that they had, and so I try to put that in the drawing, so this is an Instagram that I have, it's really for the families, it's pretty small, but um, sadly, you know, I've only been doing this for a little while, and I've already drawn 25 families, and I meet new families all the time that have been, um, victims of this uh, epidemic. So um, one last project that I did, again, just sort of an ad for, you don't have to be an artist to do community engagement using art. I um, partnered with a group called Say Their Names LA. And um, as part of LA County um, Department of Mental Health's We Rise um, uh, in 2021, we uh, did these workshops online all through Zoom. And I created uh, two zines with them, um, two little publications that we printed like 1200 of and handed them out all across county. Um, and they're basically kind of like resource guides, stories and artwork created by family members and their supporters um, that um, from this movement of um, people who have been um, killed by law enforcement. And so the um, the first one is a has a it tells stories um, like this is Marco Vasquez Jr. and he was having a mental health crisis and they called 911 for help and tragically instead of receiving the help the, care, the help that he um, was that the family was seeking for him he was uh, killed by LA County sheriffs and so um, what his brother talked about was you know originally one person in their family was having a mental health crisis, but now they all were having a mental health crisis because they were trying to deal with this thing that had happened to them. And then there was a resource guide and the resource guide was in English and Spanish. And, um, and, it, has, and it has great, great um, mental health resources that are not for a crisis. So, you know, um, uh, lines you can call for support for, um, and, and I had the young activists call all the phone numbers and, and you know, have a, like a long in-depth conversation with the, with the volunteers or the workers that answered at every hotline um, to see um, what kind of support they provided and whether they might call law enforcement. Because what we were really looking for was an alternative to 911 that you could call if a family member was having a mental health crisis. Unfortunately, we found that if the person was deemed to be a threat to themselves or others, almost every crisis number would call um, would, would call law enforcement if in that situation. And that's where a lot of the really terrible outcomes happened. So there's still a great need for resources um, for people experiencing a mental health crisis that will not involve um, armed response. But anyway, so the, um, the poem on the right is by Gaha Murad. Her brother, um, Feras, was a honor student at Moore Park College. He had a bad experience experimenting with uh, psychedelic mushrooms like a lot of college students try and fell out a window and, and again um, they called for help and he got um, armed response to, um, and a bad outcome. Um, but some of it you know it was really uh, amazing experience for some of these, um, these uh, uh, family members and young activists they'd never seen their work in print and then it, the entire county got um, not the entire county but you know the our the little zines went out across the entire county they are in the gallery right now so if you want one you can come to my show at college of the canyons and you can get a set of um of them for free the the, the blue one has uh resources for um for trying to prevent a crisis. The green one has um, resources for after a crisis has happened. So there's an interview with the grief and loss counselor talking about how, to, how we move through grief and how, and there's a uh, legal aid and, and other things like that. Um, this is an artwork 
uh, created by the family of David Sullivan, who was um, killed by Buena Park police. And um, they go to the site where he died every month and place flowers. And so they're not artists, you know, but but I found out that they had this archive of taking pictures of the flowers and they just came over my house and we sat down and made this collage that gives a little bit of the sense of the huge impact on families when somebody is lost in this way. And uh, this is the back page of the green booklet. And so I guess I'll stop there and let you guys ask questions. But um, but if you're at all local to Cerritos College, I would I want to let you know that we're going to have an in-person reception. We just got permission for it on um, Saturday, March 19th from 2 to 4 p.m. with an after party in down at a, at a um, rooftop restaurant in downtown Newhall. So if you're in the area and you want a like an informal or maybe even a formal gallery walkthrough and it's going to be a very safe reception out on the lawn. So um, so please come if you can. That's it. So Deborah, I just want to say thank you. Um, but I do want to clarify, I know you said Cerritos Gallery. It's actually College of the Canyons. Oh, sorry, Gallery. you're right. I'm like, I'm sorry, I, too many No, schools. no, for, for College just, of the okay. Canyons. College yeah, of the so Canyons. just to clarify, um, Deborah has been working on, um, uh, with, with we, we have a, a project we've been working on for almost two years now, or just a little over two, um, a whole group of students, uh, actually Stephen Bretnall is here, one of our artists who's also been participating from um, a student perspective. And we have some of the drawings that Deborah has done of community folks, some of our folks on campus, as well as some of her other um, paintings or drawings that she has done through her, her work uh, over the years. It's a, it's a beautiful display. Uh, again, you all are welcome. And then as Deborah said on the 19th, um, she will be uh, there on campus from two to, to uh, four. So I wanna just open this up. So I think we're probably, unless there are any questions, I think we'll, we'll say goodbye and wish everyone a, a nice weekend.